Let's rise up to pray. As we come before the Lord this time around, what's our desire in the presence of the Lord? You commit yourself to the Lord, He will challenge you, He will stir you up, He will renew your strength and spirit for service. You are going from here to do exploits for the Lord. All distractions, all disturbances, all discouragement, the Lord will take you away from our lives today. good for us to be here. And Lord, we believe all that you have to do in our lives so that we can be who you want us to be. You will accomplish before we leave this place in Jesus' name. I am asking tonight specifically that the Holy Spirit will stir us up. I pray that Lord, every yoke of frustration, discouragement, will be broken tonight in Jesus' name. All those who are thinking of retiring from the army, resigning from their commission, and already they are reserving their energy, and they are no longer committed as they used to be, as, as they ought to be. Today, a new thing will be done in our lives. In every one of our lives this evening, Father, you will open a new chapter in Jesus' name. Father, we are praying step by step, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, as the army of the Lord, we will march triumphantly, victoriously, into your presence on I in Jesus' name. Thank you because you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at the message this evening, yet a little while, just a little more. Yet a little while, just a little more. The Christian calling is basically and broadly a twofold preoccupation. First, we walk with Christ, and then we walk with Christ. This is what we have described in Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. I'll be reading verse 20. Exodus chapter 18 in verse 20. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them, number one, the way wherein they must walk, number two, and the work that they must do. That is the brief summary of the Christian calling. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, was offering him counsel air, needed insight into spiritual leadership, especially the art of delegation. Moses was the leader of three million Jews, and he alone, single-handedly, was the counselor of three million people. It was wearing him out, and it was delaying the performance of the job. Jethro, being around at this time, had noticed this shortcoming. And then, being a spiritual leader himself, he offered this insight and counsel to Moses on the need to delegate the work. But then he was talking about the primary role of Moses after he had delegated the lesser tax. And then he said, you will still stand to teach the people of God. And the summary of what we'll be teaching the people will be these two things. The way wherein they must walk. That is the walk. 
and the work that they must do. That is the work. These two together form the Christian calling. And these two are to be the simultaneous preoccupation of every true child of God. And so, after we have given our lives to Christ, because the work with Christ commences at the moment of repentance, we are told, can two work together except they be agreed? The Holy Savior and sinful man cannot work together. And so, sinful man must agree with the Holy God by repenting of his sinful way, acknowledging the supremacy, the sovereignty, the lordship of Christ over his life. He accepts him into his heart, is born again, is changed, is regenerated, is converted, he starts the work with Christ. After he has started the work with Christ, there is a call upon his life. There is a commission upon his life. There is a charge from the Lord of his life and is told he must work with Christ. But we need to realize that as we begin to work with Christ, as we begin to actually do service for God, there are a lot of things that seem to discourage us on the way. Very often, the Christian worker is overwhelmed by the odds in life. At times, a Christian worker is discouraged by diabolical, devilish manipulations. At times, we are distressed by delayed expectations. Or it could be we are distracted by diverse problems we may have. At times, the trouble comes from our trials and temptations. Or it could be we are weakened in the work. And we are wearied and weighed down by worries coming from different areas of life. It might be we are frustrated because of the fears we are having. But then, there comes a note of encouragement, a challenge, and a charge from the Lord to us today. That we have to arise because it is yet a little while. All things shall soon be consummated. We have to do just a little more and will be translated to glory. I pray the Lord will keep us to the end in Jesus' name. We need to understand that the call of God demands, number one, lifelong loyalty to the Lord. If the Lord has called you, and there is a general call to every believer to serve the Lord, to preach the gospel, to win souls. There is a specific call and command, as we have learned before now, to every one of us to win the youth to Christ. If we have received that call, if we have received that charge, if we have received that command and commission, then we must have lifelong loyalty to the Lord. Not only that, that call will demand from us continuous commitment and complete consecration. We must not reserve our energy. We must not think of resigning or retiring from active service. We must have, to the very end, complete consecration and continuous commitment. Not only that, number three, the call of God will demand from us a rigid resolve. Resolve there means a decision, determination, fixity of purpose. To serve the Lord to the very end. The maxim, the motto of the Christian worker then is this. No looking back. No drawing back. No going back. In Luke chapter 9, I'll be reading verse 62. Luke chapter 9, in verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The story then should be onward ever, backward never. But let me show you the passage of scripture from where we get the first part of our message title tonight. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'll be reading from verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Verse 37. For yet 
a little while. For yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But then, in verse 39, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Yet a little while, just a little more. In Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work, and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints in the past, and ye do minister in the present. What is a challenge to you now? You've done it in the past, you are doing it presently, and then in verse 11, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful. That's the challenge we have from the Lord today. The Apostle Paul had written to the Hebrew believers, these were people who had faced serious, intense persecution, as a result of which they had incurred terrible losses and frustrating calamities. But then, they still encourage themselves in the Lord to persevere. And Paul writing to them, emphasized the need for them to persevere in their work with the Lord and in their work with the Lord. He gave them a threefold appeal. In the first place, he emphasized to them the imminence of Christ's coming as a way of encouraging them to continue to walk with the Lord and to work with the Lord. He told them, yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That was a note of encouragement to ensure that they continue to walk with the Lord and to work with the Lord. Secondly, he expressed the implication of carelessness in Christians. He told them, if any man draw back, the result will be perdition. That soul will be destroyed. That soul will be ruined. That soul will be lost. He was still trying to encourage them that there is no hope in looking back. There is no hope in going back. There is no hope in drawing back. Their story should be one of continuous spiritual progress. And then thirdly, he explained to them the importance of consistency and commitment. He charged them they should be patient until the very coming of the Lord. As we look at the message before us today, the message naturally divides into two parts. Yet a little while. All things shall soon be consummated. In view of that, just a little more. We should renew our consistency and commitment. So there will be two parts to this message this evening. Point one, the imminence of the consummation of our calling. The imminence of the consummation of our calling. Or you could call it the shortness of time. And point two, the importance of our consistency and commitment. The importance of our consistency and commitment. Let's look at the first part of our message. The imminence of the consummation of our calling. I go back to Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 37. Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 37. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Our emphasis is on those words for yet a little while. The word there actually refers to the imminence, the nearness, the closeness of the coming of Christ in this original context. But in the context of our message tonight, we are applying that expression to four things. 
Number one, it applies to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. The soon coming of our Lord and Savior. Number two, it applies to the shortness of our life span. The shortness of our life span. Number three, it applies to the shortness of the lost soul's life span. The lost souls who are trying to reach the youth, they also have a brief, a short lifespan at best. And then number four, it applies to the shortness of the listening span of adolescents. That is, the youths who are trying to reach, this is the time that they are most receptive to the preaching of the gospel. I will explain that in the course of the message. I said, number one, it applies to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. See that in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, in verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now, now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Our salvation there means our final salvation. It actually means our glorification, the end of the journey of faith, our translation to glory. That is the meaning, our perfect, total, complete deliverance from the world of sin and from the presence of sin. Understand that the believing soul has been saved from the power of sin. It's no longer a slave to sin. He's been redeemed. He's converted. He's born again. He's a new creature. He has been saved as well from the penalty of sin. He's no longer going to be condemned and judged and sent into the place of perdition. But then, he's still living here below. And sin is ever present. The flesh fights. The devil resists. The world is dirty around him. But the final salvation will come when this believing soul will be taken from the presence of sin, taken from the polluted environment, the world there below, and it will be translated to the very presence of the Father on earth. In my Father's house, where there are many mansions, and there shall his salvation be eternal, final, and full. So when he says our salvation, he's talking about our glorification, our translation to glory, our permanent and final deliverance from the world of sin and the presence of sin. Now it says that time, that hope, that translation, that expectation is nearer than you ever thought. The soon coming of our Lord and Savior it's only yet a little while. The trumpet shall soon sound. The Son of God will soon come. It shall not be long. It says our salvation, our glorification is nearer than when we believe. When did you give your life to Christ? Five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Three years ago, we are told here, when we believe, look at the span of time. Now, in the present, the coming of Christ, the approach of the Son of God, the appearance of our Lord and Savior is nearer than when we first believe. That should challenge us and stir us up. If that be the case, we have no option than to encourage ourselves and continue in active service till our Lord appears. Let me talk a little about the appearance of our Lord in glory. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, of course, you know the story there. I read from verse 13 quickly. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Church, the church at Thessalonica had been planted by Paul the Apostle, but there was widespread persecution, resistance, and opposition. 
Eventually, he had to leave Thessalonica, but the church continued fervently and faithfully in the truth of the gospel. At this time, after Paul had left there for a while, it was a virile church, a sound church, a strong church, a steadfast church. They lived according to the level of light they had, and they were steadfast in obedience to the truth of the gospel. But then, something started to happen in that church. Beloved saints were dying. And so few the acts of the people in that church. They contacted Paul the Apostle and they needed a clarification of the repeated occurrences of death among the saints. And Paul now said, oh, there is something you don't seem to understand. There is an event soon coming, yet a little while, that you do not seem to fully comprehend. And then he started explaining to them the issue of the rapture. In verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also we sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the express revelation of Christ, by the word of the Lord, that we which are physically alive and spiritually we remain, we are abiding in Christ unto, until the coming of the Lord, we shall not precede. That's the meaning of the word prevent. We shall not go before them which are asleep, those who have died in Christ in the church age. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the earth. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, Paul elaborates the Christian hope in four affirmations. In the first place, he says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That we call the return. That's not the actual second coming of Christ. That's only the first phase of it. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and at the sound of the last trump. That is the return. The Lord is going to descend in glory. The moment that happens, oh, the dead in Christ will rise first. That we call the resurrection. Having raised the Christian dead, God is going to bring them with Christ. Now it says, we who are still alive as believers, and we are abiding in Christ, we remain in the faith of the gospel, we shall be caught up. Those two words, caught up, can be rendered as rapture. In the Latin, it is raptus. In the Greek, it is apaso. It means to be sneezed. To be snatched away, to be carried off, to be grasped hastily, to be seized by a superior supernatural force, to be taken suddenly. That is our hope. So he says, We that are alive, we shall be raptured. You see the sequence. First, the return. Christ appears in the sky. Next, the resurrection. The dead in Christ, they are risen first. Next, the rapture. We who are alive and remain, we are caught up. And then, the fourth affirmation. All of us together, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The grand, the great, the glorious reunion. The return. The resurrection of the dead in Christ, the rapture of the living saints, and then the reunion at the feet of Christ. All this, yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Don't you see the way Paul ends it up in verse 18? Wherefore, abuse one another with these words. Wherefore, Make one another sorrowful with these words. Comfort, exhort one another with these words. He is coming. The king of glory. No more sorrow, no more weeping. For all the story among the people, Christ is coming by and by. Yet a little while. He that shall come will come. 
That is the first aspect of what we are saying when we say yet a little while. The time is short. The Son of God will soon be here in the little interval left. Considering the shortness of time between now and the revelation, the appearance, the coming of Christ to take away the saints, can we afford to have our hands around our waist, forlorn, frustrated, discouraged, distressed, dejected, and cast down? No, we cannot. We cannot. Because we have only a short why? Our Lord is coming. In view of the fact that our Lord is coming, what will Christ expect when he comes for the saints? Oh, you know it already, but let me remind you. Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, look at verse 12. It says, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return in verse 13 and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them occupy till you are discouraged occupy so long as you are appreciated by your fellow workers Occupy so long as there is a big title describing your post. Occupy till when? Till I come. When the Savior comes, I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. That song agrees with the scripture. So, because he is coming, yet a little while, remember, he wants to find you faithfully fervently, fruitfully serving. When he comes, he wants to see you occupy. The word occupy can be translated as B.C. Totally wrapped up. Completely committed to the task he has given you. When the Savior comes, he wants to find you working, serving, laboring for him. My brethren, throw away the discouragement of the past. Some of the things that have discouraged us, they appear lawful. But in the light of the expectation of our Lord, nothing can lawfully disengage us from active service. We must renew our commitment to the Lord today. So that is the first aspect. Yet a little while. It refers to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. But then, even if Christ does not come now, if it takes the next 15 years, if it takes the next hundred years, there is still the reference to yet a little while. The second aspect, the shortness of our own life span. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4, I'll read from verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city. And continue there here year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth comes on the stage at back for a little time and then vanisheth away. That is the description of our life. Life is brief at best. You are thinking of the next 30 years, the next 50 years, the next 60 years, where we claim the promises of God. Yes, we believe the truth of the word of God. Yes, the promises of God are here and amen. But the fact is that it could be and it might be that the end is nearer than you have ever thought. Yes? Who knows? Appointed in the divine power. Decided by the Almighty. Our life on earth is brief and short. We have not a moment to waste. Each setting sun. Each crying of the cock at dawn. Each ticking of the clock. Each passing moment is bringing us closer and closer to the end of our life. 
And so we must realize that there is not a moment to waste. Yet a little while. And the sun of your life and my life will set. Before then, just a little more. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. In verse 4. I must walk. The works of him that sent me while it is day. Why are you so particular? The night coming. When no man, no matter how zealous, no matter how dynamic, no matter how aggressive, no matter how motivated, no matter how strong the drive. When he talks about the night, he's not talking about the natural night. It's an adapted usage of the word. When he says the night comes, he's talking about the night of your personal life. When the sun will set upon you. What do you know about the night? The night when the sun has set. The night when the day is over and darkness has covered the sky, the horizon. The day of opportunity, over. The time to labor, over. The sun has set. What do you know about the night? In the night, doors are shut, gates are locked, men are going to sleep. When the door is shut upon us, the door of gospel outreach, the door of opportunities, at that time, it describes the night. It could be the night of your personal history, when the sun has set upon your life, and you are gone from the land of the living, yet a little while. It could be the night of human history as a whole, when the end of all things has come, and there is no longer opportunity to preach the gospel, and to serve the Lord, and to jump around, and to be committed. It could be the night of the soul of the sinful man. When before you can run to get at him, he has died in sin and gone to hell to perish forever. The night cometh. In these several ways, when no man can walk, the soul is beyond hope. If he dies in sin, the soul can no longer come back to earth and walk. If it has gone to glory, the night cometh. Our life, brief. Our span of life, short. Yet a little while. We don't have time to waste. We have a little time to serve the Lord, to labor for the Lord, to work for the Lord. And now is the time to labor for the Lord. Look, yet a little while. But then I said number three is the shortness of the lost soul's life span. First Corinthians chapter 7 quickly. First Corinthians chapter 7. I read in verse, start, in verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. Yet a little while. The time is short. All those sinful souls you are looking at and you are saying, these are young, young people, these are young, young people, young, young people die. It's yet a little while for them. The time is short. They are here today, tomorrow they are not there. So, we have to do a little more to reach them now. Not only that, the fourth one, I told you, the listening span of childhood, of adolescence, is short. I will explain that in the course of the message. But for now, write down Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 on that. Now, in view of what we have said so far, yet a little while, the imminence, the nearness, the closeness of the end, of the time we are to serve, the imminence of the consummation of our calling, what is important is the fact that we should be consistent and committed to the Lord. We must do just a little more. That takes me quickly to the second and last point, the importance of our consistency and commitment. In Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well doing for yet a little while. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Can we faint? Yes. Can we be weary in well-doing? Yes. 
Well doing is not giving ten cobalt to, be, to the beggar. That's well doing. But that's at the lowest rung of the ladder. Well doing is not giving a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. Wonderful, beautiful. That's an act of charity and love. That's well doing. But that is not the height and the depth of the description of well doing. The greatest good you can do a soul is to snatch it from the jaws of death, doom, damnation, and destruction and set the feet of such a one on the road to Beulah land. The greatest good you can do a soul is to facilitate the translation of that soul from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the dear son. That's the greatest good. And if you are employed in that noble vocation of helping souls, a brother was talking, and then somebody said that the expectation had been that he would work in an embassy. That is, where you have uh, the offices of countries representing some other, maybe the country, the office of Germany or any other of this country, America, Britain, in Nigeria, the embassy or the high commission. That somebody said, the expectation had been that this brother will work in an embassy. The brother said, yes, I am still working in an embassy. What do they do in the earthly embassy? They issue visas to people traveling to their country. That I am working in an embassy that will give people visa to heaven. What a beautiful description. I say that to tell you this. If you are working in that embassy, where you are giving people visa to heaven, you are helping, facilitating, they are getting to glory. And then you get weary in that well-doing. You become discouraged, dejected, distressed, and disheartened. What will happen? The Lord is encouraging us today. No matter what has happened, no matter what has overwhelmed your heart, no matter what has dampened your spirit, remember, we have no time to waste. Yet a little while, the end is closing upon us. We just have to arise and do a little more and throw away the chains and the sharp weary in well-doing. But there are antidotes against this ignoble cause of abandoning our God-given conviction and commission. The uniform testimony of the scripture is that the way we end up matters much more than, we, than the way we started. I read to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 where it says, We desire that you show the same diligence unto the very end. And then you remember in Matthew chapter 24 verse 13 where it says, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. I've explained that salvation to you. Not only that, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8, it says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The way we end up matters much more than the way we started. Lot's wife started the journey to safety but ended in damnation and perdition. The way we end up matters much more than the way we started. There is a roll call of a lot of people in the scripture. They started well. They were progressing in the journey. They were going on in their pilgrimage, but they didn't end well. But I believe God and persuaded of better things of you, we shall end well in Jesus' name. Now, there are three things I want to emphasize before we pray. The first one is that we have a sevenfold commission. The second one is that we have a sevenfold challenge. And the third one is that we have a sevenfold call. A sevenfold commission, a sevenfold challenge, a sevenfold call. First, the sevenfold commission. Number one, there is heaven's commission. Write down Luke chapter 19 verses 12 and 13 because of my time. There he says, Occupy till I come. Clearly that's a command. That's a charge. That is a mandate. That is a commission. Occupy. Be busy. Be active. Be laboring till I come. Until you see me in glory. Until I appear to take you. Until you come to my presence in glory. Don't stop working. Don't stop sacrificing. Don't stop laboring. 
Don't stop endeavoring to ensure that souls are saved. Heaven's commission. Number two, the only angel's commission. Write down Acts chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. I'll read that quickly. Acts chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. It says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. The angels of the Lord, they are spurring us on. They are stirring us up. They are supporting us. They are standing by us. What are they doing? They are fellow servants. But they don't have the commission to preach the gospel. They expect us to do our part. Why they do their part? They are standing solidly behind us, challenging us, encouraging us, saying, Saints of God, don't be weary. We are working with you. Don't you know angels are working with us as bodyguards to defend you in the course of the duty? Not only that, as ministering spirits to carry for the divine errand as we decree, as we declare the gospel and as we pray, angels are fellow workers with us. They are fellow servants with us. And they are encouraging us. They are commissioning us. They are mandating us. Continue, 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 continue. Don't you learn? We have a commission from the holy angels. Number three, we have a commission from the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, you write down verses 28 and 29. This is the day of the latter rain. God is moving in his power again. The Holy Spirit is there, charging us, backing us up, supporting us, ready to empower and to use us. And he's saying, are you an available vessel? I will make you able. I will fill you up. I will use you. I am ready to make use of you. Keep on doing this work. A commission from the Holy Spirit. Number four, do you know we have a commission from the Eden, the unconverted? In our own case and context, the unconverted youths, we have a commission from them. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. And it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. He asked to the man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over, come over, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after I had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly guarding that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. We have the call from our own Macedonia. Look at your cultic youth. Look at the youth from the broken homes. Look at the youth that are in despondency. They have tried different things in life, looking for thrill, satisfaction, and they have found none. They are despondent. Many of them are contemplating suicide as an option to end their lives and terminate their frustrated existence. They are calling us, they are beckoning to us, and they are bidding us, won't you help us? Will you, because of personal problems, allow me to sink into hell and get destroyed forever? Help me, I'm perishing. Help me, you are the truth. Help me, you have been raised up to help me. Help me, there is a call upon your life to help me. The hidden, they are challenging us. They are actually mandating us to rescue them. There is a commission from the hidden, number five, the holy men of God in glory. They are also commissioning us. They are saying, we have treaded that path before. We have done this duty before. We have gone where God sent us. Can Paul look on us from heaven and he will not say, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel? Can Peter look on us from heaven and not say, To call the word with the whole world? Can James look on us from heaven and will not say, I was beheaded for this thing? Won't you give your life for it? Only men of God gone by as they look at us from heaven. Clouds of witnesses. I won't be able to read. Write down Hebrews 12, 1. They are also commissioning us and they are saying, in our time we did it. Will it fail in your generation? Will it fail in your time? They are challenging us just a little more. Just a little more. We suffered. We thought uh, at times we were discouraged. But now the fight is over. The battle is won. We are triumphant. We are enjoying. We are in the only presence of the Father. We have inherited beauty and glory and life eternal. It will soon be your turn. Yet a little while. Saint of God, fight, fight, fight. You will soon join us up there. Keep on working. Keep on serving. Keep on laboring. The holy men of God gone before. They are commissioning us. Not only that, the hymn writers. Inspired hymn writers. Press on. It won't be very long. Soon we'll be done with the troubles of the world. I've enlisted for life in the army of the Lord. You know that song? What a beautiful song. There are many songs like that we could quote. The hymn writers too, they are inspiring and challenging us, commissioning us. We must continue. 
And do you know what? There is a commission, number seven, from hell. Write down Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. Can you hear the known voice from hell saying, Father Abraham, I have five brethren. Let him go and preach to them. I don't want them to come here. To come here? I don't want them to come here. Are you not hearing that commission? People are crying in hell and they are saying, Oh, my husband must not come here. My children must not come here. And their only hope is our commitment. If we are discouraged and we fail, they will cry. The people they are crying for will come and meet them over. We'll go and meet them over there. I know we will not disappoint the Lord. So we have a sevenfold commission. Number two, we have a sevenfold challenge. There is a challenge of the unfinished task. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 38. Has the task been finished? You see, the problem is that we are looking at our crowded classroom. When you are in a school of 4,000 students, and then you are meeting a classroom for your fellowship, and you have 40 youths, but the classroom is filled up. You say, brethren, glory to God. We have breakthrough. We have revival. We have explosion. God is moving. This place is filled up. Holy Ghost is in control. My friend, you are deceiving yourself. 40 out of 4,000, there is breakthrough. 40. Satan is still controlling 3,960. Laughing over them, sitting over them. And among your motley of 40, there are five witches. Ten backsliders, four serious folks, there is revival. No, there is no revival yet. The task is yet undone. Am I right? Look at your city where you have come from. It could be there are up to 200,000 youths there. Maybe 800 are in the church. Is the task finished? Can we say, God, it is finished? No, Jesus could say it. We can't say it yet. The task is yet unfinished and it's a challenge. Just a little more. Number two, the challenge of the unrelenting tempter. Write down Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Are you not challenged by the devil? Since you gave your life to Christ 10 years ago, he has not stopped pursuing you. This money still tempted you. When you leave this place, he will still tempt you. If you live long enough to be 20 years old in Christ, he will still be pursuing you. He never gives up. The Sabbathless Satan, the legionless Lucifer, always pursuing, always saying, Let's try more, let's try more. Do you know the message I'm preaching? Satan preaches it over and over to his people. Yet a little while, yet a little while. Follow him, follow him, follow him. The time is short, the time is short. Revelation chapter 12, we are told, He knows that he has but a short time. He has deeper understanding of this thing. And he says, Pursue, pursue, pursue. We don't have time on our hands. Pursue, pursue, pursue. Will Satan outdo us in commitment and zeal? We have a challenge from the only lenten tempter. Number three, there is the challenge of the understanding of tomorrow. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6, that we are building the church of tomorrow. We are building the society of tomorrow. There are different aspects of the future. There is the educational future. Educational system is in shambles. But as God uses us and helps us, we have something to offer the youth and to redeem the educational system. Number two, eschatological future. Number three, ecclesi ecclesiological future. Ecclesiology, relating to the church. The future of the church is in the hands of the children and youth workers. We are shaping the future of the church. We are molding the future of the church. We are building the future of the church. That understanding of tomorrow that we have is a challenge that we can't toy with the future of the church. We can't stop because of personal problems and discouragement. The future of the church is at stake. Evangelical future. In your hands are the overseers of tomorrow. In your hands are the coordinators and pastors of tomorrow. Just a little more. To build them up. To help them. To make them sound and solid. So that we can guarantee the future of the ministry, not only of the church. And then environmental future, the future of the society at large. Number four, there is the challenge of our upcoming translation. James chapter 5 verse 8 tells us something as I'm rounding off. James chapter 5 in verse 8. What are we told? Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Yet a little while. 
So there is a challenge of upcoming translation. Very soon we'll be taking from here. So let's continue to labor for the Lord. Number five, there is a challenge of the uniqueness of this time. The youth were angry. They will not remain used forever. This time in their life is so unique. It's a transitional stage from childhood to early adulthood. Adolescence. This period of their teen age. Do you know what? A number of things I would I want to say tonight, but I'm rushing because of my time. A woman, Florence Key, wrote a book, How to Reach the Children for Jesus. And she gave these figures. Listen, 96% of all conversions take place in childhood. If you deal with 20 adults, one will get saved. If you deal with 20 children, 19 will get saved. Meaning that if we allow this period to go, it will be adding in sin. Another preacher, respected man of God, Dr. George Trett, said, he wrote a book, Modern Illustrations for Public Speakers, after the age of 25, only one person in 10,000 receives Christ. After age 75, only one in 700,000 will be saved. If we don't win people while they are young, they may never be one at all. Not only that, another man, Reverend Joe Wilson, he had a book, Advantages of Early Conversion. That's the title of the book. He said, listen, suppose that Paul had been converted at 70. Instead of 25, there would have been no Paul in history. There was a Matthew Henry. Because he was converted at 11 and not at 70. A Dr. Watt. Because he was converted at 9 and not at 60. A Jonathan Edwards. Because he was converted at 8 and not at 80. A Richard Baxter. Because he was converted at 6 and not at 60. How much more a soul is worth that has a lifetime of opportunity before it than the soul which has nothing. D.M. Moody was organizing a crusade. And then sent a message to the wife and said, We had three and a half converts. Later, the woman was trying to clarify from him, What do you mean by three and a half converts? Do you mean three adults and a child? Because she had been trying to figure out in the absence of the husband before the man came home from that evangelistic outreach, what was the meaning of half? Half woman being three and a half? Three and a half? Then the old Moody said, The half is the adult. The three whole life are the children because a child has a saved life an adult has a saved soul. For the child, you lay the foundation, you build the structure. For the adult, the structure has been erected. You're only going to repair the building. It's like a burnt candle. Opportunity almost gone. And the song of the adult must I go and empty and day? But the song of the youth, I have a whole lifetime to serve Jesus. Satan, wait for me, I am coming. Now, here you are. And we are serving God to reach this youth. This is a unique time. The Lord will strengthen our hands. I said the Lord will strengthen our hands. Not only that, there is the challenge of our ultimate triumph. Write down Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. At the end of the day, you will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lastly, there is a challenge of useful and triumphant ministers gone by. We have a seven-fold call. What's the call? Number one, a re-evaluation of and a return to Calvary. Look back at Calvary, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners, lest ye be weary in your minds. Looking unto Jesus. Number two, rededication and consecration. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Consecrate your life. Devote yourself to this one task. 
Number three, a resolve to be ever committed. Psalm 57, verse 7. My heart is fixed. O oh Lord, my heart is fixed. Number four, a rejection of all distractions and discouragement. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Lay aside all weights and the sin that doth easily beset you that you might run the race. You need number five, a renewal in spirit and strength. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. But don't stop there. When you renew your strength now, what do you do with that strength? No, you will now run and not be weary. The strength is renewed so that we can run. We can labor and do more for Christ just a little more before yet a little while. Number six, a realization of the essence of your existence, the purpose of your life, that God put you here to get something done for heaven, and you will do it. It will be accomplished. And you will receive a word done for it in Jesus' name. Write down Isaiah chapter 43, verses 7 and 21, and Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21. And then today, there should be a request for unending usefulness. See that in Psalm 71. We're about to pray. Psalm 71, verses 17 and 18. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and either do have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, now also, when I am old and gray dead, O God, forsake me not until I have shown thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Understand? Just a little more. A little more preaching, teaching, training, and counseling. Jeremiah 28, 9. I said I will not preach again, but his word was like fire in my bone. I could not forbear. A little more prayer. First Peter 4, 7. A little more perseverance. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. A little more patience. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Let me just round off now, finally, with the story of this man of God. Because it's a challenge to us before we rise up to pray now. You know the story of John Wesley? Bucked down by a Satan engineered and energized wife. I have personally read the stories of his marriage from different books. And oh, it was horrible. Terrible. It was just so bad. In fact, in one of the records, the woman succeeded at one time after pulling the hair of John Wesley, dragging him. She succeeded in pulling off some of the hair of his head. You know what that means? And all through that marriage, it was conflict, contention, confrontation, assault, attack. During that period, was Wesley weeping in a corner and wasting away and whiling away his time? No. Wesley was still advancing the cause of Christ, carrying his cross, and yet advancing the cross, challenging hell, expanding the frontiers of the kingdom. If Wesley could do that by the grace of God, we can do more. Apart from John Wesley, there was Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth had a very grievous medical problem for some years, up to three, five, or six years in his life. He had stones in a sensitive part of his body. They call it stones in medical parlance. And this man, he will be groaning in pain, serious pain, on the bed. And from that bed, they will, call and tell, they will come and call him and say, it's time for crusade to come and preach. He will manage and get up from that bed. Then he will stand before the people. He will preach. He will make other call. And he will start to pray. Come and see miracles. Miracles. But the miracle will not send to him and remove the stones. After he has finished, he will go back to that bed. He will begin to groan in pain. To sleep in the night. Miracle. In the day, pain. In the evening, souls are being won to Christ. We go what if he could do it by the grace of God for those gruel some years. We can do more. How about... You want to hear more? Apart from we, Goosworth, watchman knee, 
When these communists came to power in China, Washmani was in China. They dealt with this man. They wanted to break his spirit. But the man would not relent. They put him into prison for over 10 years. And while he was in prison, his wife was there. Can you imagine the cruelty and wickedness of these people? Well, the wife one day wanted to climb up in the house and take something from upstairs. The something she was climbing on was not properly placed. And so the thing just uh, gave way and she fell down seriously. As a result of the complication from that fall, the woman died. But the husband was still in prison. When news got to him in prison, the authorities refused to release him. He bought the pain alone. He was there in prison, shut up there. Gospel he couldn't preach. Wife has died. He's still there in solitary confinement. So somebody now wanted to ascertain, will this man still stand? He succeeded in smuggling a letter to the cell to inquire after the health and the state of Washmani. Washmani, you know what he said? So really what he said is that all those things cannot move me. My spirit cannot be dampened by those things. My face is set like flint. And I know I'm getting to the end of my life. There is work to be done for God, and it shall be done. His heart was so said that if the communist authority will release him from prison, from prison to pulpit. We can do something for God. I said we can do something for God. It's only a little while. He that shall come will come. He will not tarry. God will help us. Just a little more. A little more teaching. A little more prayer. A little more perseverance. We can do something for God. We can rededicate our lives to God. We can reconsecrate our lives to God. Nothing will deter us. Nothing will discourage us. Nothing will hinder us. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. Yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry.